Welcome colleagues to our webinar on the US elections and higher education, pandemic, democracy, science and the public good. We think we can fit all of those into 60 minutes uh, and we welcome your questions and discussion and statements to help us do that once our three speakers are through. We've got great speakers for this uh, webinar. We're really pleased about to have with us Oyan Poon, Brian Passa and Barrett Taylor. And uh, I'll introduce them piece by piece as we come a lot, uh, to their turn in the succession of speakers. Uh, Brian will be starting us off, but let me run you quickly through the, the webinar protocols. Um, webinar is being recorded as usual and will be posted online in its YouTube form on the CG website. We say in due course, that usually means within 48 hours. Um, and the transcript of the chat function will also be posted. So everything you're saying and every gesture and uh, every time you pick your nose, it's gonna show up in future. So be very careful what you say and do. Uh, please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or want to ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during, this, during the webinar, but um, please turn it on when you're asking your question. We recommend you use speaker view so you can more clearly see who is talking. To ask a question, use the chat function. We advise you to forward your questions early in the webinar. They're more, much more likely to become part of the webinar if you do that. They tend to pile in in the last five or 10 minutes and good questions don't, don't get heard. So that's always a pity. So ask your question early. Um, once our speakers are finished, we'll then go to the Q&A section and I'll invite you in to ask your question if you're selected. Um, and I'll give you a warning in the chat that that's gonna happen. So keep an eye on the chat if you forward a question. When you're invited to ask a question, please unmute yourself, always a very important step. Uh, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. At this point, it's a delight to welcome uh, our colleague, Brian Passer. Brian is Associate Professor of Higher Education at the Curry School at the University of Virginia, a doyen of higher education studies in the US and a colleague of many people around the world who's a prolific scholar and thinker about, uh, a critical thinker about US higher education. Brian. Thank you, Simon. And thanks to everyone at CGHE who has made this possible. Let me begin with my condolences for those around the world affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. There have now been at least 1 million deaths from COVID globally and in the United States over 200,000 deaths. I think I can speak for my colleagues in saying, <clears throat> excuse me, that in raising the issue of the pandemic in this presentation today, its impact on politics or policy or institutions, we in no way intend to shift focus or understate the human cost of this tragedy. I'd like to turn attention at the outset from the impact of the presidential election in the US to the ways in which scholars and researchers of higher education might better understand what is happening now and in the future. My colleagues will address particularly important issues and we can combine both approaches in the question period. But because national elections are inherently about the exercise of power, I'd like to turn particular attention to some examples of what this moment in the US reveals about power, about norms and about structure in the political system in the US, and some examples of how closely those forces are reflected in higher education. I'll be using the lens of Stephen Luke's three-dimensional model of power as presented in his foundational work, Power, a Radical View, which I highly recommend to everyone. I'll begin with a few words on elections on what elections reveal and what they conceal. Elections are an example of contest that Luke's would place in the first dimension of understanding power. In the first dimension, a contest is visible, the sides are distinct, and preferences are relatively simply quantified. However, I'm gonna to argue today that elections in the US are better understood as an important but not determinative moment in much longer and more opaque contests over norms, historical understandings, the construction of ideology, and structures of power. The basis for my argument comes from Luke's second dimension of power where contest is less visible, where ongoing structures and norms and ideological symbols 
shape the terrain and agenda and rules of contest. Luke's notes that power is created and preserved by non-decisions, outcomes predetermined, predetermined by history, norms, and structures, and processes like agenda control. This dimension is also where we find the influence of information, of media, and marketing, what Bachrock and Barrett's termed the mobilization of bias, or what we more commonly refer to as preferences, which they found at the heart of politics in the United States. So there are myriad ways in which structure shapes the distribution of power in politics in the US, and I'll address one here. There's little question that former Vice President Biden will get several million more votes than President Trump in the November election. Of course, that has nothing to do with whether Pre Vice President Biden will become president. Because of the Electoral College, a process of apportioning power to each of the individual states rather than summing all votes cast. The Electoral College was designed to help preserve privilege and political control for those who were in power in a very different time and place more than 200 years ago. While only five presidents in history have lost the popular vote and won the election, it's been the good fortune to do so of two of the past three presidents, George W. Bush and Donald J. Trump. Luke's third dimension of power explores the idea that when structures and practices of power are truly instantiated in a society, many people do not even countenance that the society could be ordered in a different way. In the 2016 presidential election in the US, about 56% of the voting age population actually voted. This placed the US number 26 of 32 countries in the OECD. While a relatively difficult process for registering and casting ballots is often used as an explanation for this, it's likely that some degree of Luke's third dimension of power pertains here. So how does a critical model of power help us understand the impact of the upcoming election on higher education in the United States? I'll present a few examples to lead into the remarks of the other panelists. This election is very much about the role of the state and the civil society in shaping civic life. The neoliberalism inherent in many of the Trump administration's policies has shifted state resources and decision-making from the state to the civil society. Yet for more than a century, state action has shaped essential aspects of public and private higher education in the United States. Interest groups in the civil society, including for-profit universities, have continued a multi-decade contest that would further reduce the state role and turn more educational funding to the private sector. Other interests, particularly powerful business lobbies, have worked to reduce tax funding that supports schools at every level. That reduction in state support has in turn driven tuition increases, increased student debt, and default. The role of the state and civil society in higher education and the relative power of each arena remains oddly under-theorized in the US, where we most often speak simply of public and private spheres. And it's also the case of lobbying, community organizations, and other vital but less visible expressions of power that take place in the civil society are not well understood in US higher education research. But beneath the surface debates over the path forward for the country, both candidates are highly reliant on symbolic narratives, appeals to emotions, and creating a vision of the nation now and in the future. These are so familiar as to be ritualistic, and they're distinctive to each candidate. Most reflect historical struggles as understood through a contemporary lens. The election will be determined by which candidates better align with the hopes and fears of the electorate rather than by policy prescriptions. And this suggests to me that research and scholarship in higher education should focus more intently on beliefs about higher education in the country and globally, and about the powerful influence of what the sociologist John Meyer called myths and sagas about organizations in order to complement the evidence-based approaches that hold excuse me, pride of place in so many fields. Of particular import to higher education, challenges made by the Trump administration to research and scholarship, student speech, and post-secondary policies do not gain power from the presentation of evidence as much as from the mobilization of a political base. A significant concern is that one outcome of the election may bring more intensity to the ideological challenges raised against universities while universities rely on evidence and nonpartisan stances in defense of their practices. 
So it's also the case that the tension between individual rights and collective action in the public interest is a focal point of this election. The Trump administration's approach to the COVID crisis has valorized individual rights and local authority over management by experts in federal agencies. Should Trump win re-election, this subordination of the state role in preserving the collective well-being may reshape the ongoing contest over the state role in the production of public and private goods through higher education. And not incidentally, our understanding of public and private goods in higher education has been greatly enhanced by the work of our moderator, Simon Marginson. A question animating the Trump campaign is who belongs to the polis in the United States? And similarly, whose values, beliefs, and cultures belong in the United States? You can substitute higher education for the United States and find the same questions contested. Who belongs in higher education? Whose values and cultures and beliefs are at the center of higher education in the United States? And perhaps the most vital question, whose higher education system is it? President Trump has projected a narrow vision of what he terms the real America, while former Vice President, takes a, former Vice President Biden takes a more expansive view. The election will have significant consequences for those who depend on the adjudication of these questions for their place in the country and in higher education. The US is increasingly stratified on many dimensions. The same is true of higher education as my co-panelist Barrett Taylor and his co-author Brendan Cantwell show in their latest book. The wealthiest institutions, public and private, increasingly and disproportionately enroll students from the highest income deciles in the country. The Trump administration policies that increase income and wealth stratification in the broader society are having a similar impact in higher education. That growing inequality, declines in state support, high levels of debt and default, and persistent lack of inclusion in US higher education should open space for a deeper analysis of post-secondary exceptionalism in the United States. That exceptionalism is based to significant degree on the structuring of norms of prestige, of research power, and student excellence that underpin the construction of elite higher education in the US and are long instantiated and taken for granted today. So in sum, the election in November will tell us something about how we see ourselves as a nation now and how that's reflected in our system of higher education. If used as motivation to look more deeply beneath the surface, to better understand the less visible exercises of power in the United States and in its post-secondary system, the outcome of the election will give us much to consider as we contemplate more deeply how we got here. So I think I'll stop there and turn it back to Simon. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, that was extraordinarily helpful, I think, in uh, unraveling the, the depth of the issues and um, particularly your point about beliefs, about values, about um, different narratives um, and, uh, and about the salience of these non-rational elements um, in considering um, politics, policy and the practices of higher education. Oyan Poon, our second speaker, is a program officer at the Spencer Foundation She's also an associate professor affiliate in the Department of Educational Policy Studies at the University of Illinois in Chicago and a faculty affiliate in the Higher Education Leadership Program at Colorado State University. And her work focuses on the racial politics of Asian Americans and college access policy, particularly as animated by debates over race conscious admissions or affirmative action in US higher education or young. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's wonderful to join you all today from Chicago. Um, thank you for this invitation. Um, when I agreed to participate in this webinar, I feel like a, just a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, uh, the world felt disastrous then. But today the urgency feels even more heavy. After last week's grand jury decision and absence of justice in the Breonna Taylor murder in Kentucky, and the continuing COVID-19 pandemic that keeps revealing uh, deep structural entrenchments of white nationalism. Uh, let me start by noting this headline I saw over the weekend in the New York Times. I feel sorry for Americans. 
in this moment, I also feel baffled this morning waking up to a million COVID deaths around the world and more than 20% of them here in the United States. Um, but my presentation today is entitled Multiple Pandemics, Dis and Misinformation and, and Future Possibilities, as I want to strike a critical yet hopeful note today. So the COVID-19 pandemic has unveiled deep structural inequalities, particularly in the persistence of racism. As a public health crisis, COVID's burdens of death, as you can see on the left here uh, in this data visualization from AAPI data, and the data source being the Marshall Project, um, the, the burdens of death have not been equally distributed. As college campuses also insist on bringing students back to campuses, and go forward with football games. Uh, on the right, I'm reminded by my colleague, Dr. Eddie Cole at UCLA, that the burdens borne by students are also unequal. And we continue to be in a reckoning, this is nothing new, the protests against racial injustices, particularly anti-Black racism in the United States. Um, we are in a very deep reckoning right now with a long um, systemic racism, particularly anti-Black racism. As the medical students on the left at University of California, San Francisco remind us, racism too is a pandemic. And there have been countless black people who have been gunned down by the state and this list of names on the right is only those I think that uh, we are aware of because of cell phone video technology and so forth. There, there are countless more who are, remain unnamed. And in this COVID moment, We've also seen the resurfacing of long-held anti-Asian racism, uh, which has always been there, but veiled, I think, in polite society. Anti-Asian violence across the country can be tied to Trump's insistence on calling the coronavirus the Kung flu and the China virus, even at the UN last week. Two weeks ago, a report from San Francisco State University documented that one in four Asian American youth have reported racist bullying in the last six months. Yet, all of the, I believe 164 Republicans um, in the House of Representatives voted against a resolution condemning anti-Asian racism. Thankfully, this resolution still passed because uh, the House of Representatives has a majority of Democrats in it. And to be clear, the resolution bore no financial costs and yet 164 Republicans uh, opposed a simple resolution to say, racism is bad. Racism against Asian Americans is bad. Um, it, it leaves me beside myself oftentimes. Um, in, as, as you'll see, these headlines come from just the last two weeks. And then last week, in the midst of all this racial reckoning, Trump called for a purge of critical race theory and generally an end to any federal support for initiatives that point to racism as a problem as he issued an executive order last week. Um, and there are questions now about federal funding for research or initiatives around teaching um, out of higher education that would critically analyze racism, its problems, and how to solve these problems. Add to this Justice Ginsburg's passing and the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to replace her on the Supreme Court it has been an especially difficult last two weeks in the midst of months years and quite frankly, decades of uh, white backlash against civil rights policies. But there may be hope. Uh, while the presidential election is critical in how the future unfolds, as um, we have already mentioned, and whether critical race scholarship like mine and others will be purged, quote unquote purged from the academy, I'm hopeful that voters in California will pass Proposition 16 which would repeal the state's ban on affirmative action. If reinstated, affirmative action in California would allow state agencies to first acknowledge and state that racism and sexism are public problems. Um, and secondly, be allowed to address these problems in their systems of public employment, contracting, and public education by considering race as one among many factors in the distribution of opportunity to highly qualified applicants. Unfortunately, as this headline states, while Californians overall say they support racial justice, 
they're, they remain rather uncertain whether they should support Proposition 16. The latest polling found that something like a third of voters remain uh, undecided on this ballot measure. The uncertainty among California voters may have to do with the very deceitful campaign from the opposition, which has co-opted civil rights language and taken Dr. Martin Luther King's words out of context, for example, on the left. This flyer on the left was from when Proposition 16 was still called ACA 5, as it was making its way through the state legislature, and was produced by the Silicon Valley Chinese American Foundation. In addition to conservative Chinese American immigrants, the opposition is supported by Ed Blum, who is also responsible for gutting the Voting Rights Act in the Supreme Court case Shelby versus Holder. Uh, Blum has also tried to dismantle immigrant voting rights here in the United States in a lawsuit called Evanwell versus Abbott. Blum is also uh, the architect between Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin, as well as SFFA versus Harvard and versus UNC and versus UT Austin. Um, and so Blum and these um, cohorts of folks who are against race conscious policies are really hoping to root out any use of any acknowledgement of racism as a problem in our public institutions. Um, on the right here, uh, what was fascinating and so appreciated by advocates for equity was this Twitter response from Dr. Bernice King one of MLK's children who's come forward to endorse Proposition 16 and called on opponents to study her father's words more deeply and comprehensively. <clears throat> Excuse me. I agree with Dr. Bernice King. We do need more comprehensive study of her father's words, but Trump's recent executive order will also make that a bit more difficult for that to spread um, and be supported structurally. At the end of the day, how Californians will vote on Proposition 16 depends on their ideologies. In my research, I've interviewed um, several Asian Americans involved in the debate over affirmative action in the last several years. And I've been astonished by how many on all sides of the debate hold misinformation about how affirmative action works in college admissions. They believed in myths that uh, race conscious admissions was about quotas, a cap, uh, point system, a preference that it was somehow race-based admissions. Um, no admissions decisions are simply based on race. Um, you know, that the truth is. Um, but, you know, I was equally astonished that most of the folks I interviewed uh, in the pie chart where it says holistic review, most of them also believed that applicants' context and conditions of educational opportunity should be accounted for in the admissions review process. Um, like the cartoon on the right, you see this very quick representation of inequality in society and what different people have to overcome in accessing public resources and opportunities. Um, so there are these very fascinating um, discourses happening where people believe they know what uh, policies are, but then when push comes to shove, uh, it turns out that they're operating under these very deep myths and uh, misinformation. Still, what I've learned over the last two decades of observing, studying these matters of racial politics, facts don't seem to have much effect on people's positions, unfortunately. There's a lot of misinformation and disinformation in our electoral politics and public policy debates, which is amplified and reinforced by the Republican assault on research and analysis seeking to dismantle systemic racism. Ultimately, the question of how people will vote in Proposition 16 or in any other election will be a choice in personal ideologies. Let me end here by sharing one of the quotes I've been meditating on recently. Um, it's by the late Grace Lee Boggs, a Chinese American philosopher and Detroit-based community activist. She said, you don't choose the times you live in, but you choose who you want to be. Uh, she lived until she was 103 years old and was very active until the very end. As with any election and movements for change, we have choices. And I'm feeling a deep sense of anxiety right now, but also hopefulness in this moment that my fellow Americans will choose decency and anti-racism. Thank you. Thank you, Oyan. Thank you very much. And thank you for bringing forward stigmatization of Asian Americans and anti-Asian American racism for, as an issue. I think that 
our audience is interested in that and uh, we haven't seen enough about that. Um, so it's really nice to have it there and uh, in the context of a larger you know, question about, about white supremacy and racism. And these issues have also got resonance in other white jurisdictions, in other um, white dominated jurisdictions like the UK and Western Europe and so on. Um, I'd like now to bring in Brendan. Uh, sorry, Brendan, uh, not Brendan, it's Barrett. The <laughs> famous co-authors, Barrett and Brendan, have tripped me up for a minute there. Um, Brendan Campbell is our valued colleague, but Barrett Taylor is our speaker. Um, Barrett is an Associate Professor of Higher Education at the University of North Texas at Denton. His research focuses on power and inequality. He has a recent book, as Brian mentioned, with Brendan Campbell, focused on higher education, uh, its financing and uh, its ratification. Um, Barrett. Thank you, Simon. And thanks to both Simon and Brian. I feel like I'm going to move more uh, copies of the book uh, today than I have uh, in quite some time. So thank you for, for bringing it up a couple of times. Um, uh, I, I think uh, Brian and Oyan have done such a great job of uh, outlining where we are and the stakes and, and sort of the the landscape of the politics and policy of higher education in the U.S. at this moment. Um, what I really want to focus on today um, are the uh, uh, how we got here to some extent. Um, I think most all of you will know that in the U.S. Um, it's the 50 states that bear the primary responsibility for um, chartering and governing and funding higher education and um, thinking about um, how the politics and policy of higher education has uh, been negotiated and uh, uh, hashed out over the last decade or so at the state level, I think will help us to think uh, about how we got to where we are today. We'll touch on many of the themes that you've heard about already. We'll talk about values that sort of center these things. We'll talk about, certainly about white backlash, uh, as Oyan mentioned, and white rage in the, in the terms of uh, Carol Anderson, the historian. And my argument is that it leads to this uh, policy agenda that I refer to as deinstitutionalization. Um, we often, especially in the US, where we tend to uh, be very fond of uh, triumphal stories with happy endings, um, tend to tell the story of higher education um, getting better and having these very disturbing, unacceptable roots in the past with uh, enslavement of persons and settler colonialism and things, but that we have uh, 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 confronted these and now with the central institution in a democratic society. There is some truth to that, but there are also deep problems with that narrative. That narrative requires maintenance to be true. Uh, Brian's mentioned sort of neoliberal incursions to that in the form of reduced funding and competition and things like that. And my argument today is that we now see particularly from the political right at the state level in certain state contexts, an agenda that actively works against uh, higher education as a central institution in a racially diverse democracy. That's trying to undercut the material and social basis, the funding, but also the trust and the confidence in experts and curriculum and self-governance that allows higher education to operate as a critical institution in our society. Okay, that's a lot of preamble. Let me get into uh, how I sort of motivate this argument. Um, I see uh, two major trends in US society that have put the US and the political right on a collision course um, in the last um, uh, decade or so. Uh, although these roots as, as the political scientist Joseph Lowndes has demonstrated go back uh, really to the civil rights era the, they've just become much more intense in the last decade or so. Um, one of those is the idea of white backlash, white rage, uh, the racial anger gap in the terms of David Phoenix. This idea that um, uh, the, the right, particularly the Republican Party, has become much more demographically white, become much more skeptical of the existence of structural racism, um, over the last decade, and there's a lot of political science research from Alan Abramovitz and Leanna Mason, besides Tesla and Bobrek, uh, books that have gotten a lot of attention um, on the way that's true. And that has happened at the same time that higher education has inadequately still a ton of work to do as we confront racial injustice on our campuses, 
uh, but has made moves toward being less white. Um, enrollments uh, have changed, curriculum has changed, although far too slowly. Um, and that puts higher education in a position to sort of trigger this white rage uh, and these politics of, uh, of rage and resentment. Higher education has also grown, of course, in scope. Simon, Brendan, uh, lots of folks have written about these, uh, the expansion of higher education into high participation systems. That raises costs, per student costs are rising as well. And that's happened at the same time that the right has become much more closely allied with the politics of the economic elite in the US. Um, we all know about wealth concentration globally and particularly in the US uh, from Piketty and Size and folks who've worked on that. Um, and then there's a whole scholarship around in political science from Larry Bartels and Hacker and Pearson and folks on how um, the Republican Party in particular, although in many cases, particularly in the project of neoliberalism, it's been a bipartisan consensus, how policy has been crafted to protect those interests, right? So we have two collision courses for higher education on the right. One around race and rage and resentment, the other around uh, a public uh, part of, as, as Brian says, civil society and the state broadly conceived um, that requires funding, um, but that is also um, asking for that funding at a time when there's been this pushback against taxation and redistribution in any form. Um, and so my project, and this is a, a, a book length thing that I'm wrestling with, and Brian's been really helpful as I uh, sift through these ideas, um, is to look at some states where the demographics of higher education have changed, at least relative to the state fairly quickly, right? Where higher education has become, used to be a bastion of white uh, privilege in terms of demographics, is still a bastion of, of, of white privilege in terms of its practices, but is less demographically white than the state. Um, at least compared to the recent past. And then also states where partisan control is contested, right? Because if you're going to uh, engage in these political uh, uh, attacks on higher education from the right, trying to delegitimize, deinstitutionalize, destabilize the enterprise, um, you want some electoral benefit from that, right? And in, this, in a state like mine, where demographics are ch racial demographics are changing quickly, but partisan control has not been particularly fiercely contested over the last couple of decades. Uh, it would be surprising to see this kind of thing because it's not necessary. So we're really looking at places where demographics have changed and then where there is this um, uh, idea that political control might change hands. So motivating every voter really matters, particularly on, on the right, um, on the Republican coalition. So what I argue is then that leads to this, this policy agenda of deinstitutionalization for higher education. Slashing funding is a big part of that. I view that as a necessary precondition rather than a sort of defining characteristic because as many of us have demonstrated in various ways over the years, that's been part of the policy agenda for higher education for several decades now. Um, but the depth of the cuts, uh, it was about 58%, I think in inflation adjusted dollars in Arizona about right around 50% in inflation adjusted dollars in Wisconsin over a decade. Uh, the depth of the funding cuts is particularly dramatic in some cases. Um, and it's often targeted as well. We've seen states um, uh, target policy, uh, finance policies at uh, public historically black colleges and universities in North Carolina, um, at uh, community colleges in Arizona that were uh, providing in-state tuition to uh, DREAMers participants uh, in the uh, President Obama's Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals program for immigrants in the United States. Um, but what I really think characterizes this policy agenda and makes it distinct, distinct from the sort of souped up neoliberalism, right? It has elements of neoliberalism. There are even some echoes of the old liberal consensus here. But I think what makes it really distinct is this, uh, this attack on the social basis of higher education, trying to undermine trust in the enterprise. And we see that in a lot of different ways. We see it around curriculum legislation introduced in Arizona uh, and, and in Wisconsin around critical studies or whiteness studies classes, um, efforts to uh, get rid of the humanities and social sciences or severely con uh, constrict them at some regional campuses in Wisconsin, um, limiting the ability of the Center for Civil Rights at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to engage in uh, lawsuits on behalf of uh, 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 plaintiffs who view that the, uh, uh, who, who are uh, um, going to court to protect their civil rights um, or their human rights from their employer or from a, 
uh, a business or a government office or something like that. And that was a center that was entirely, or is a center, that's entirely funded by donations, according to its public records, and yet had its uh, latitude clipped like that um, in a way that aligns with the interest, the electoral interests of the right in a highly contested state. Um, this leads to broader questions about self-governance. Um, perhaps the most famous and most literal instance of this uh, conflict that any of us can conjure is the uh, uh, from uh, two years ago now, the long running conflict uh, between students and faculty on the one side and, and uh, gov Board of Governors members in North Carolina over the presence of a Civil War statue on campus, a literal memorial to uh, 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 the, the practice of enslaving people. Um, and that became a very uh, long and, and, and uh, uh, bitter conflict that resulted in folks losing their jobs and acts of, of vandalism uh, uh, on, against a memorial to, enslave, memorial to enslave people on campus. Uh, it really goes to this question of self-governance. Can higher education sort of govern itself without uh, overt interference from uh, partisans on, on the right? And certainly, I think, I think Brian and, and Oyan both brought this to the, the fore, where they're thinking about um, biomedical research, critical race theory, um, fundamental protections of tenure and collective bargaining rights, undermining the role of faculty members and experts in society, um, all of which contribute to this decline in trust, I think, that sort of is, is aligning to remake higher education, to emphasize the parts of it that are preferred and de-emphasize the parts of it that are not preferred in these states where um, racial demographics and rates of participation have changed rapidly and partisan control is highly contested. Uh, now, I am an academic. Most of us are academics. We're used to thinking in abstractions and systems and things like that. But I want to leave you with um, uh, what I think is the real takeaway here, which is that these abstract general arguments about institutionalization and control and a, and a policy agenda for higher education have real consequences for real people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Using the method of synthetic control, uh, which is a political science technique or a technique that I borrowed from political science, uh, where you can simulate a, uh, a case, uh, a counterfactual for a case if a policy intervention had not happened. Uh, I took the campuses of the Maricopa Community College System in Arizona. It's a broad access group of campuses. Um, and they had their funding zeroed out by the state in 2015 amidst this controversy over providing uh, in-state tuition to undocumented immigrants. And looked at what would have happened in a simulated world if those campuses had not had their funding zeroed out. And that vertical line you can see right here, I apologize, this is a little pixelated. Uh, I did this on my uh, uh, Commodore 64, so these are as good as the graphics get. Um, uh, but you can see that vertical line represents defunding, right? And the, the simulated case and the observed case, this is just one of the campuses, there are 10 campuses in the system, and most of them look very similar to this. The simulated case and the observed case are very similar right up until that moment of divestment. And after that, the two lines diverge, right? And what we're seeing there, what the, this simulation is showing us is that this community college campus, Glendale Community College within the Maricopa District could have provided more services to a more racially diverse group of students had it had the money. We're seeing the real human cost of this policy agenda of deinstitutionalization. Uh, that's plenty from me. I wanna thank you all very much for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, for that really picked up a lot of issues. And um, I'm going to ask the first question, and it might be one for Barrett and Oyan. And no, I think we'll make it Brian and Oyan, and I'll give Barrett the second question. I'm going to be the questioners for a little while. We've only got one coming in so far. Um, my question is, first question is this, it's about the Supreme Court and the uh, Trump decision to put forward Amy Coney Barrett as the pick for the replacement. Um, we've heard a lot about what this might mean in relation to gender. What might it mean in relation to race? And what might it mean in relation to higher education? I mean, not just in relate the Supreme Court, but the combination, say, under a Biden government of a hostile Senate and the Supreme Court being what it will be after uh, the president's uh, nominee is, uh, is endorsed by the Senate. Ryan. What do you think? Um, I think I'd let Oyan go first and then I will follow okay. up. Yeah. 
was going to uh, let you go first, Brian. <laughs> okay, well, sure. I, I think it's a really interesting question, um, Simon. Um, and we underestimate two things, I think. Uh, uh, globally, perhaps people may not be aware of just how powerful the United States Senate is in, uh, in the sort of overall governance of the country. Um, because the, the Senate uh, fundamentally and in many, in many conditions and, and contexts um, controls the construction of the judiciary throughout the United States, not just the Supreme Court, but federal courts at every level um, are comprised by a presidential nomination and, um, and then a uh, approval by a majority of the Senate. And during the latter portion of the Obama administration, when Republicans controlled the Senate, um, the term of art was slow walked. Uh, the Republicans took up very, very, very few of President Obama's nominations. Um, and when they did take them up, they often voted them down in the, when they were in the majority. Um, and then of course, there was the, the opening on the Supreme Court with the passage of uh, the passing of Antonin Scalia, which they refused to take up um, and, and set the stage for Donald Trump's first appointment to the Supreme Court. And now we see the sort of reverse of that coin uh, being played out now. But, but fundamentally to the arguments or the, that we've been making today, the Supreme Court is quite anomalous in the United States in that it's not um, proportionally represented on the basis of pop, uh, I'm sorry, the United States Senate is not proportionately based on population. Each of the 50 states have two senators. So the state like Wyoming, which represents 500,000 people, has two senators making these, these crucial decisions uh, about the Supreme Court and other courts. Um, and a state like California, uh, with 40 million people, has two senators. Um, so the judiciary is, is very much in the hands of a, a relatively disproportionately small percentage of the population in the United States because of the distribution of those um, senators. So as to the logistics of a, a Supreme Court um, under President Biden, much would depend on who could, which party controls the Senate. Um, if if, if uh, former Vice President Biden, if President Biden were faced with a, a Senate minority uh, and this Supreme Court uh, with a majority of Republican appointees, um, there's little that he can accomplish in terms of judicial appointments or judicial authority. So I think that that's kind of the, the conundrum um, that the country has faced for a very long time because of our, our long allegiance to structures and, and formulations of political power that go very deep into our history. So I'll just um, add on um, the, the federal cases that I'm most familiar with are uh, Ed Blum's cases, the SFFA versus Harvard case, as well as SFFA versus UNC Chapel Hill and SSFA versus University of Texas at Austin, um, all making their way through the federal courts. A few weeks ago, um, the, the appeals court uh, heard the Harvard case. Um, and that case is certainly looking like it will arrive at the Supreme Court probably around 2022. So in, in very short order, it will be at the Supreme Court. Um, and with a 6-3 conservative majority, um, it is not looking good. But the Supreme Court surprises quite often, as it did in UT Austin, the Fisher versus UT Austin case in 2016, uh, where Justice Kennedy ruled in favor of the university and acknowledged that diversity matters in constructing uh, the best possible educational environments, that there are great and deep uh, educational benefits that come from diversity um, as decades of research has shown. Um, and so whether that research will remain respected by the court in this next go round um, remains in the air. Um, but again, I remain hopeful because you just never know. Uh, the Supreme Court is a curious beast. Um, I think in other matters, the biggest question, as Simon, you pointed out, was uh, around gender and um, women's rights with uh, a Justice Coney Barrett. And um, as I pointed out before, you know, when one thing happens for everybody, there are disproportionate burdens placed on various populations. And so Roe, there's plenty of questions about this 
what will happen to Roe versus Wade, um, the access, you know, and access to reproductive health uh, and uh, an abortion. Uh, there are major questions and, and if Roe v. Wade is overturned, even though it's long been precedent, um, I think we will see disproportionate impacts on our young women on our college campuses and um, across the country. Um, there are questions of transgender rights as well, um, gay marriage. Um, you know, I worked at a Jesuit Catholic University when ho the Hobby Lobby Supreme Court case uh, basically made it very difficult for me to gain access to reproductive health because my university as a Catholic institution decided to essentially remove my insurance health access to reproductive medical attention, um, which was very uh, challenging to say the least. So um, as a, as a pre-tenure faculty member at the time, that was very concerning that I had to shell out several hundred dollars a month just for reproductive health. I think you're muted, Simon. Thanks, Oyan. It's a mistake I make about once every 10 webinars. <laughs> Today I made it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've got a question for, for Barrett. Um, science. I mean, for, for those of us outside the United States, one of the most important things, if not the most important thing that American universities do is they produce science in great numbers and great quality. And we use that work and we work with American scientists and, in doing so. And, uh, you know, it's a great public good. It's a great global public good. And it, it goes everywhere. Um, and the administration, as it's called, is uh, not friendly towards science in general and some particular forms of science in particular. Uh, if uh, the president's re-elected, what can we expect for um, science in the United States? Boy, that's that is a great question, Simon. And I, I want to apologize to everyone. Uh, uh, Oyan pointed out to me that you were not able to see my slides during the presentation. I apologize for that. I, I won't give the presentation a second time. I will invite you to join my uh, instructional technology and higher ed seminar, because I'm obviously very good at doing this kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, there's long been a sort of bipartisan consensus in the U.S. that certain kinds of science are worthwhile, right? And Sheila Slaughter and Gary Rhodes traced that up through the 90s, and it's sort of drifted since then into this kind of um, uh, stuff that can be commercialized or marked particularly in the, in the life sciences, right? And we really see that in, in the um, overwhelming emphasis of U.S. universities in a life science publishing profile, right? And that comes from where their, their funding is and things like that. And that's very different than um, uh, some of the more balanced research portfolios that you see from other universities worldwide. Um, you know, I, I think there's a good chance that science funding would sort of continue to drift because oftentimes um, I think the conflict, particularly nationally, and I, I'm thinking of, of Daniel Hopkins' work on the nationalization of U.S. politics, uh, really does focus more on values and the way Brian's talking about it than specific policies. And so I, I, I'm not sure that it's necessary to defund the NIH in order to um, uh, uh, show that, you know, in, in the way that Oyan's talking about, that we're holding higher education to account for its, its purported leftist tendencies. Where I would expect um, real influence from the partisan political side uh, would be in the continued man, uh, uh, sort of filtering of data and numbers um, that are official government records of things, right? If you look at the way that figures on the pandemic have moved from one government agency to another to change the sort of public face that the government's putting out about the pandemic. I would worry a lot about that kind of thing um, that seems to have a high return on investment politically in terms of the way it gets into the, the disinformation um, ecosystem online. If you've looked at the network propaganda stuff that's come out of communication studies um, and that seems to have real electoral payoff uh, in a way that uh, dealing with the 
Byzantine bureaucracy of funding maybe doesn't as much, but goodness, speculating about the future is a, is a, is a fool's errand and I'm the fool to do it. So thanks for asking. Simon, I wonder if I could chime in on that. I think you're muted again, Simon. Yes, yeah, Sabra, I'm coming. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I agree with Barrett. I would add just a couple things. One is that uh, one of the hallmarks of the Trump administration's approach to everything has been to privilege capital. Um, and so uh, the simple way to put it, I think, is that the ways in which they will try to fund and, and accelerate certain kinds of science will be directly related to the ways in which that science supports capital formation and capital accumulation. Um, things like, uh, like science for the national security apparatus um, and, and things that lead to basic, move from basic to applied research applications. Um, but there's also going to be a move away from things that right now are troubling the big capital like global warming, um, like any of the collective global public good problems that we face that would require taxes and costs on, um, on capital in the US um, are gonna be frowned upon. And to, to, to Barrett's very good point about the politicization, not only of data, but also um, the way that clinical trials and things are being handled with vaccines, um, the politicization of the ways in which we see them maybe the most important scientific issue facing um, the globe in this, in this moment, um, that process has been extremely politicized in, in, in both science process and reporting out in the US. Thanks, Brian. Um, can I bring in Hector Rios at this point? Hector, unmute yourself and fire away. Yes. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. yes we can. Great. Go for it. I'm Hector, I'm doing a PhD at, at, at UCL, uh, but I'm in Chile right now. Um, I was wondering if, 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 the, if the panel, but especially Barrett or Brian, can, can say something about it, if, if we can see any important po policy announcement um, in, in the debate. Uh, in, in the side of, 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 of the left-wing politics, for example, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren has a uh, very interesting proposal about free education, uh, ways to tackle the problem of student debt, um, I don't know if those issues can reappear in, in, in the debate or there's going to be some uh, interesting announcement about higher education funding policy. That's for you, Barrett, I think. Great. Thank you, Hector. Thanks for the question and best of luck to you with your studies. Um, I, I think, um, again, I'm the wrong person to predict the future. Uh, I would be surprised if there were a particular policy proposal put forward in, beyond what's already out there, right? Which is sort of a, a, a quasi two-year promise from the Biden campaign. Um, now, I certainly could be surprised about that, but you asked specifically about proposals coming from the left. Um, my question for the Biden campaign, and I'm still waiting for them to take my call, so I don't expect them to, same for the Trump campaign. I'm not expecting any, anybody to be asking me for advice. Uh, would be, I think, often about what the um, political philosopher Danielle Allen describes as a democracy agenda, a pro-democracy agenda for U.S. politics in terms of increasing representation and the number of, uh, of, of folks in this country who don't have any formal representation in the House or the Senate. Um, and while I, I, I certainly her electoral proposals make a ton of sense to me, her overall agenda makes a ton of sense to me, I do think that there needs to be a space for higher education and other civil society organizations in the way that, that Brian talks about the state broadly conceived in an agenda like that. And so I would hope to see things like that added as it moves forward. But at this point in the campaign as to whether they're, they're going to push something out there, um, given everything else that's going on, I don't know that higher ed is at the top of their uh, agenda. I would love to be wrong just because I care deeply about higher ed and I'm always looking to see folks uh, reinvest uh, material and social resources in it. Simon, Thanks, could, Simon yeah, could I add? We've got two more questions, uh, which okay, I'll try and squeeze ahead. them in. So, um, I, can we bring in Yun Lee at this point? Hello, everyone. And this is for Brian. Oh, yeah, thank you. 
Um, well, I'm from South Korea and I'm currently studying international higher education right now. And I have a question about um, the international collaboration, how it might change after the new pres presidency comes in. So especially when um, we consider that China and the U.S. is having a lot of data, actually, but they have this political tension right now. Do you think the new, pol uh, new presidency would take different positions on international collaboration, especially considering China and U.S., the relationship between the two countries? So it's a China-U.S. Uh, collaboration question. Um, sure. I'm happy to speak to that, Simon. Yeah, far away, Brian. Um, you. Yun Lee, thank you for your question, and I hope all goes well for you at home. Um, I think that in under a, obviously under a Biden presidency and a, a Trump re-election, you'll see very different U.S.-China relations, at least um, on the surface, in terms of diplomacy um, and respect. Um, President Trump has uh, made much of his um, uh, of the tension that he feels between the United States and China. He vacillates between, between sort of accolades for China and then in terms of other rhetoric and, and policies, he's trying to position himself as very tough um, on China and, and even to kind of create a historical uh, account that says we've long been too conciliatory to China and we should be tougher there take, that China's taking advantage of the United States. Um, that, uh, President Biden would, would take a much more conciliatory line, the kinds of soft power initiatives that could include things like the ways in which we think about international research collaborations and international students are something that um, Biden would, I think, pretty happily endorse and promote. Um, better relations in general. One of his pillars of his platform has been the idea that we've become isolated internationally, that we've turned away from traditional allies, uh, including in many, in many respects, China. Um, the deeper structural challenges and, and competition between the country um, are for another day. But in the short run, yes, there would be a considerably different approach between a President Biden and a President Trump. One more question, I think, on my list, and that's from Mohammed Mokhadam. Mohammed, can you come in, please? And I think, um, or yeah, we might give this to you because we should keep a balance in our questions. Okay, can you hear me, Simon? Yeah, can, can very well. Thank you for this event. I really trusted on learning from this event. Uh, my actual idea is that alongside the domestic policy of U.S., uh, during the current years, we have seen that the foreign policy has been affected. Uh, the actually international scientific collaboration between uh, the researchers, uh, students, specifically from uh, Iran University uh, to abroad, not even US to the other countries uh, in the global sphere. Uh, our studies shows that uh, actually uh, U.S. banned uh, the collaboration between uh, Iranians and uh, with non-Iranians. I myself believe that in long term, if we would like to achieve sustainable peace, if we would like to achieve actually sustainable security for all of us, uh, we have to uh, have we have to have a dialogue together when uh, there is no exchange between Iran and Saudi Arabia, when there is no exchange uh, in terms of students, in terms of professors between Iran and Egypt, between Iran and US. So how can we achieve uh, the peace? Uh, this is my idea. Uh, uh, however, I'm not the citizen of US, but I believe that US uh, has a strong role in uh, global affairs. And even uh, in terms of democracy, the main idea uh, for developing democracy around the globe has been emerged from the U.S. country. So uh, I just want to share this idea that if we would like to achieve, uh, as a, it was interesting for me that Bill Gates has mm, uh, said an example, if you would like to uh, concur to the pandemic of corona, we have to concur uh, 
to this uh, illness around the globe. So I want to use from this point of view to mention that if we would like to have a peace inside the US, uh, we have to have peace around the globe and the faculty members, the researchers are the best choice, the best delegate to facilitate uh, this uh, vision. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Mohamed. Um, and the, the existential issues arise, don't they, from time to time in these discussions? And, you know, this is such a core challenge. Um, uh, Oyan, would you like to come in on, perhaps it'll be our last, uh, our last response? Yeah. I, I absolutely agree with Mohammed that I, I'm deeply concerned. I put it in the chat box that I was trying to find, there was a recent uh, Trump order that had an extensive list of um, countries from which uh, students and scholars would be restricted in their participation uh, with US institutions of higher education as, as enrolled students or as, as visiting scholars. And so um, I share this deep concern that Mohammed has and, and have nothing further to add other than, yes, I agree with this very problematic situation where folks from Iran are prevented from collaborating, uh, that anyone might be prevented from collaborating across um, borders. Thanks, thanks, Soyan. I think we'll move to a close. Um, I want to thank all three presenters and um, for the highly intelligent way they've gone about this and the clarity and, 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 and directness of their speech and their responses to questions. Um, it's, uh, it must be a very difficult time to be a scholar in the United States at the moment, facing this kind of binary moment when it can go either way. And uh, there's that sense that, well, you know, you could do something, but then you can't do anything. It's, sense of helplessness and a sense of agency at the same time, which is what happens when you've got that kind of political system where it gives you a bit of power and there's, everyone's talking about it, but greater forces are also at work. Um, so wish you well and uh, wish you well in surviving this process. Uh, but you know, for those of us outside the United States, we look at American politics and we think it can't go on like this, you know, sort of like that period before the civil war when, the political decisions and the distribution of formal power and so on was increasingly out of sync with what was actually happening in the society. And there's that sense that all these people are out there on the streets talking about race and that the president can stack the Supreme Court to block any progress on race for 20 or 30 years. You know, that doesn't make much sense. It doesn't seem to add up to a viable political system in the long term. So you think something's going to have to change. Whoever gets elected, uh, and it's likely that this terrible bipart uh, polarized uh, partisan conflict will go on. Um, it, it, you would think that it has to change in the longer term. So I wish you well with that. And we hope to have all three of you, severally or together, back on our webinar program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you.